Welcome to Undruggable, a special edition podcast series produced by the Scientists Creative Services team. This series is brought to you by Amgen, which is a pioneer in the science of using living cells to make biologic medicines. They helped invent the processes and tools that built the global biotech industry and have since reached millions of patients suffering from serious illnesses around the world with their medicines. While breakthrough discoveries in drug development have been made through the years, 85% of disease targets are still considered undruggable. Ray Deshays, a senior vice president at Amgen, believes that the fourth wave of drug innovation is here, led by a new type of multi-specific medicines that will radically alter our concept of how drugs can work and pave the way for new solutions. Proteolysis targeting chimeras, or Protax, have taken center stage in the effort to drug the undruggable. Researchers are now exploring other types of tax to degrade or alter undruggable targets by bringing them in proximity with effector proteins. In this episode, I talked to Carolyn Bertozzi, professor of chemistry at Stanford University, about alternative induced proximity platforms beyond targeted protein degradation. Notably, her research centers around lysosomal targeting chimeras, or LITAX, that target extracellular proteins for degradation by the endosome lysosome pathway. Hi, Carolyn. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. I thought with you it would be really interesting to dig into the discovery that was reported by your lab of a whole new approach to getting rid of proteins. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how that approach works and how you came up with that idea and launched that project? You're referring to a technology that we use the acronym LITAC to describe. It's one of the many TAC technologies that are out there inspired by you and Craig Cruz's early work on the ProTAC molecules. LITAC stands for lysosome targeting chimera. And these are molecules that target a protein of interest in the extracellular space and basically enable the recruitment of that target to the endosome lysosome pathway, which is another machinery for protein degradation. Our entry into that space has its genesis in my own interest in cell surface glycoproteins and secreted glycoproteins. I was trained as a glycoscientist. That's always been my area of interest in biology. My lab is known for developing chemical tools that can be used to study glycobiology. And I remember when you and Craig published that very first paper on the ProTac concept. I taught a chemical biology class, and that was an instant classic example of a new potential therapeutic modality born from chemical biology. I watched that technology mature from academia and then industry over the next 20 years. And I was jealous because as someone who works mostly on proteins that are outside the cell, many of which are attractive drug targets, but undruggable, there wasn't a comparable strategy to take on those extracellular proteins with a degradation modality for the simple reason that the ubiquitin proteasome system is inside the cell. Many of these targets don't have enough parts inside the cell where you could ligand them with a protac. So what do you do about all these extracellular pathogenic proteins? The LITAC strategy originated from our interest in so many extracellular targets. The thought process became action with a postdoctoral fellow, Stephen Bannock. When I did the podcast with Craig, he felt that Protax may be the first example of a modality that's completely grown out of the field of chemical biology. The first example of such a thing to really hit the big time. I'd be interested to get your perspective on that. I would agree that to me, the Protac is one of the most visible examples of translational chemical biology. And I think it's a really important story for the evolution of the field, quite honestly, because the PROTAC concept is what made chemical biology legitimate as a science in the biopharmaceutical industry. Until about five years ago, it was difficult for people trained as chemical biologists to find a comfortable home in biopharma. They were not considered real chemists. 
They didn't have that hardcore chemistry training that you associate with natural product synthesis labs. And those were the A-list chemists that pharma was always looking for. The, the chemical biologists were sort of on the B-list, right? At the same time, the chemical biologists were not considered real biologists. They weren't competing with the immunologists and the biophysical structural biologists for positions in biopharma. Protax have completely changed that. The lesson there is that transformational shifts in therapeutic science are going to come from these multidisciplinary trained individuals. All of a sudden, about five years ago, instead of my students and postdocs trying to find their back door into biopharma, I had recruiters calling me, begging me to supply them with a pipeline of trained chemical biologists at all the top pharma companies. It's a wonderful change and it's a great dynamic. And I give the ProTax story a lot of credit for that transformation. Regarding LITAX, there's a clear comparison to a ProTax where you have a molecule that has two parts. One part binds a cell surface receptor. The other part binds a protein that's either on the cell membrane or in the circulation. And by linking it to that cell surface receptor that's endocytosed into the cell and delivered to the lysosome, you could clear the target protein. That's very similar to a protac. It's a different mechanism of degradation, but you're eliminating a protein. What's clearly very different is the site of action is outside the cell as opposed to inside the cell. So whereas with a protac, you have to use small molecules. With a LITAC, in principle, you could use a small molecule or you could use a biologic that has two different arms, or you could even use a hybrid molecule, an antibody or biologic coupled with a small molecule. How do you see modality choice in this area? You see it maturing over time. In our first wave of LITAX, which we had published a year ago now, we made hybrid chemically modified biologics. For example, we took a monoclonal antibody that was specific for the target of interest and chemically modified it with synthetic ligands that engage a lysosomal trafficking receptor, the mannose 6-phosphate receptor. Those LITACs in many ways resemble antibody drug conjugates. In other work in my lab, we have made small molecule LITACs where the binder to the target as well as the receptor engager are both low molecular weight ligands that you can link together. And if someone just showed you a picture of those LITACs, they would look like every other protac, like a dumbbell type of shape. Meanwhile, you could envision making all biologic LITACs, where you have a bispecific antibody that engages the target as well as the lysosomal trafficking receptor. And I think what you choose for the particular target is going to depend on all of the forces at play. So for example, there are some targets of interest for which having a small molecule LITAC would differentiate against other competing therapeutics. There are other targets where an infusion is just fine for that particular therapeutic application and a biologic might make a lot of sense. But the optionality is there, which is, I think, something that's really fun to think about as an academic. For many of the targets that are outside the cell, you could use antibodies and then this whole concept of undruggability becomes a little less powerful because with an antibody, it's such a big molecule that if you put an antibody onto your typical target protein, even if you're not binding in an active site, often you just inhibit the target protein sterically, but you might block it from interacting with other proteins because the antibody is so massive. For example, there's many therapeutics that target cytokines and prevent their binding to their receptors. Are there particular targets for this approach that are not addressable by the existing approaches? Or instead of an antibody against IL-23, just to take one example, you could potentially deplete IL-23 using a small molecule LITAC. I think the answer is both. In the latter example, there are situations in which having a molecule that just has a different pharmacology can have a different effect. And I think more transformative would be the notion that you could go after targets that are not druggable with conventional modalities like monoclonal antibodies. I have a longstanding interest in cell surface mucins. These are molecules that are pathogenic in many settings and highly associated with malignant cancers and particularly solid tumors. Their influence on disease progression has to do with the way that they 
affect the stiffness and the thickness of the glycocalyx, which has consequences for focal adhesion formation and signaling through focal adhesions. It's not a receptor ligand biology that's blockable with an antibody. You really just need to get rid of them to have a therapeutic effect. So degradation makes a lot of sense. Other kinds of targets that are interesting to think about are protein aggregates that accumulate in the system and are difficult to target with conventional modalities. The mucin, as you point out, you're really trying to achieve a biophysical effect, and you're not going to change that by binding an antibody. You might actually just make it even worse. For the LITAC approach to work, you need a receptor that is on the cell membrane, but that presumably is internalized at a fairly high rate so that it can grab a cargo outside the cell or in the cell membrane, become internalized, and then release it so that cargo can go onto the lysosome and be degraded. I know that you had a particular one that you were working with on the paper you had last year. Do you think there's other receptor pathways out there? Are there other ones you're excited about? Or do you think there's a lot more discovery that needs to be done in that area? Well, there definitely are a number of well-characterized lysosomal trafficking shuttles that have very high capacity. Some of them are expressed ubiquitously, like the mannose-6-phosphate receptor, which is what we initially published on. Others are more tissue-specific, which brings some interesting opportunities to the table. So, for example, the acyalo-glycoprotein receptor in the liver, which is very familiar to people in the nucleic acid therapeutic space because they're using that shuttle as a means to basically accumulate their drugs in lysosomes in the liver. There are some that are neuron-specific, very well characterized. There are some that are involved in lipid uptake. We're interested in all of these. I formed a company called Lycia Therapeutics, and we're expanding the platform into other receptor spaces. I also think there's a lot of discovery to be done. We're very interested in discovering all the cell surface molecules that are really good at trafficking to the lysosome that could be used as a shuttle, even though they're not recognized so much as lysosomal shuttles today. You're thinking about using the lysosome as a way to degrade proteins that are either sitting in a cell membrane or sitting outside the cell in the circulation. How about using the lysosome to degrade proteins as an alternative destination for degrading proteins that reside inside the cell. There are pathways by which cytosolic proteins get delivered to the lysosome from the cytosol. And I know there's been some academic work trying to hijack those pathways with therapeutic molecules. I think we have just seen the very tip of the lysosomal targeting universe. And while we have focused on extracellular proteins, there's beautiful work going on in other labs. I should point out that the lysosome is a really powerful organelle for degradation beyond the proteome. The lysosome is a place where glycans get degraded, where lipids get degraded, RNAs get degraded. So the lysosome might be a place you could target other non-protein pathogenic macromolecules for degradation. Are there other types of tacks that your lab is beginning to work on or that are far enough along that you're willing to share with us? We definitely talk about other tacks. I think that there's a huge opportunity there. The idea of targeted glycan degradation in the lysosome, the glytac, that's something we're interested in. We're also seeing an uptick in academic settings of the opposite. People are now thinking about dub tacks. These are molecules that instead of targeting a protein for degradation, they target it for stabilization by bringing the deubiquitinases to the party to keep the protein in a deubiquitinated state for a longer period of time. That's exciting. There's a number of things that people have reported on bringing a phosphatase to a phosphorylated protein, bringing a kinase to an unphosphorylated protein to phosphorylate it, any covalent modification, a deacetylase or an acetyltransferase. Do you feel that these will eventually blossom into their own subfields or do you think that degradation is probably going to be the most important manifestation. Right now, targeted protein degradation gets probably 95% of the attention. Is that just an accident of history because targeted protein degradation was where this idea first really bloomed? 
or is there special utility in that mechanism that's going to make it the go-to mechanism for tax? How do you see this field unfolding over time? Well, there's something very appealing instinctively about the idea of if you identify a bad guy, kill it, right? And the pro tax is all about the bad actor. You want to take it out. You can measure the effectiveness of your drug by looking at protein levels. So th there is definitely something very attractive and broadly applicable about that concept. More recent adaptations, for example, targeted dephosphorylation or targeted phosphorylation. To deploy that idea in a therapeutic concept requires that you really have a nuanced understanding of the signaling biology underlying the disease. The more that we understand cell circuits and, and how cells have become dysfunctional and how you can return them to homeostasis, the more likely it is to take a more nuanced idea like that and translate it to a drug. That's putting faith in, in your understanding of biology beyond just, is the protein there or not? <laughs> also, with a protax, since you're degrading the protein and getting rid of it, you have a nice genetic model for that. You can knock out the protein and look at the phenotype in the knockout, or you can knock it down and look at the phenotype and have some confidence that you can emulate that with a protax mediated degradation. By contrasting you know, with these more nuanced strategies, how do you model the situation in which you've reduced the ratio of phosphorylated to dephosphorylated protein? It's harder to model that genetically to understand that that's really what you want to do to affect the disease. So again, it just requires a much deeper, more nuanced understanding of the biology. But I'm an optimist. I'd like to think that the creations from chemical biology will find their way more and more into the clinic and then benefit patients. Tax are inherently more complex if they're built prospectively. You have to find the element that binds your target. You have to find the element that binds your effector. Then you have to join them together. You can often end up with molecules that are violating multiple favorable characteristics for a molecule to have in order to be a drug, such as how soluble they are, how readily they pass through membranes, and so forth. There's a few different ways you could think about this. One is that there will be a niche for these molecules because there's going to be some diseases or targets where there's no other way. There'll be some toleration of a molecule, even if it's big and ugly and complicated and difficult to make. Another way to think about it is that with time and innovation and ingenuity, the medicinal chemists and the protein biochemists will figure out how to solve the complexity problem and will end up with molecules that are as favorable in terms of their molecular properties as many of the drugs that are on the market today. How do you see this developing? First of all, I think it's a field that's ripe for innovation. The struggle of making molecules that not only have the potency and the selectivity that you need to have the biological effect, but making them so that they can be absorbed orally and actually have a favorable biodistribution. This is one of the failure points in the drug discovery process that we've all been struggling with for decades. But now there's so much innovation in computational science and you know, using machine learning to extract from large data set the ability to make predictions and make better judgments in, in design. I would love to see the biopharma industry and, and the academicians put their heads together and think about a way to curate the massive data sets that already exist from a century of legacy molecules and see if one can actually use what we know about oral availability of different molecular structures combined with metrics of their physical properties to train an algorithm to make better predictions about how do you design something that's orally bioavailable and what physical data might you use? There's low information content data out there already. I can't help but wonder if there were higher information content data sets that could be used for these algorithms. And the thing that always comes to my mind are data sets like infrared spectra. The infrared spectrum of a small molecule is easy and cheap to acquire. And there's thousands of them out there that one could collect that are in the public domain. They're information rich. And they read out on molecular vibrations. If you collected the infrared spectrum of hundreds of thousands of molecules 
in different solvent systems and looked at how they vibrate differentially in a hydrophobic versus hydrophilic environment, that's the kind of data that you might be able to integrate into a machine learning predictor. You correlate that with oral availability and see what comes of it. So I feel like it's a great time for people to start revisiting this classic struggle with modern tools and see where it goes. I'm going to push you out on a limb. When do you think the first LIHTC drug is going to enter human clinical testing? Make a bold prediction. We formed Lycia so we could pursue precisely that dream. We're working hard there. We're fleshing out the platform and we have a development pipeline that we're working towards. I couldn't read the crystal ball, but that is a future goal. Well, Carolyn, thank you so much for this conversation. It's really been a pleasure having you here today. Thank you so much. It's really fun for me too. Thank you for listening to Undruggable. And thanks again to Carolyn Bertozzi, professor of chemistry at Stanford University. To dive further into this topic, please join Amgen scientists at the Undruggable Q&A webinar discussion on November 17th, 2021. Register for this event at the link provided in the episode notes. Induced proximity platforms are revolutionizing drug discovery in many disease areas, especially notoriously difficult disorders. In the final episode of Undruggable, we'll talk with David Rees, Executive Vice President of Research and Development at Amgen, about the promise of induced proximity drugs in treating the ultimate challenge, cancer. For more on cutting-edge research, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter, and subscribe to The Scientist's Lab Talk wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast contains forward-looking statements that are based on the current expectations and beliefs of Amgen. All statements other than statements of historical fact are statements that could be deemed forward-looking statements, including any statements around the potential science and innovation of genetics and drug discovery. Forward-looking statements involve significant risks and uncertainties, including those described in the Securities and Exchange Commission reports filed by Amgen, including our most recent annual report on Form 10-K and any subsequent periodic reports on Form 10-Q and current reports on Form 8-K. Unless otherwise noted, Amgen is providing this information as of the date of this podcast and does not undertake any obligation to update any forward-looking statements contained in this podcast as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. No forward-looking statement can be guaranteed, and actual results may differ materially from those we project.